Well, thank you all for joining uh, another C-Lab Pulse here for April. Uh, and I think a number of folks have been on these, but uh, so others know we do these every month, same time, same place. Um, and this is an opportunity to connect folks, to share updates, uh, and more or less just build community around a lot of the work happening uh, in Colorado, but also uh, often making connections nationally and even globally. Uh, sort of all things that are circling around uh, the future of education and, and work. So uh, have an awesome panel of folks. Most of the time I'm gonna turn it over and let, let this crew uh, just chat about their work and, and uh, how they're exploring sort of community and, and uh, collaboration at the moment. Um, and and uh, yeah, so certainly wanna leave as much time for that as possible. Um, right up front here before we dive in and we've still got some folks uh, trickling in, which is awesome. Good to see you, Wendy. Thanks for joining. Um, uh, wanted to give a few updates uh, high level up front here uh, from the sort of C-Lab in Colorado perspective. Uh, and, and then we'll, uh, yeah, like I said, leave, I think the majority of the time for, uh, for the panel of folks that have joined. As usual, uh, this happened last month as well. I think I, I think Walter and I chatted about this this potential topic. Um, I then reached out to five or six folks that I knew were doing incredible work, and like all of you, were available and, and were able to join. So it's a big panel, uh, but that's that's awesome, and I think it'll be a great discussion. So uh, let me I'll do a few things here. I think folks have seen it, but uh, we just have this uh, sort of running agenda. Uh, this will always be. Uh, updated with the latest and greatest. So for uh, future uh, future times together, feel free to jump back in. Uh, and that also has a log of, of past events. Um, uh, from the sort of high levels, I guess, well, I see, I'm, I'm trying to see, I don't think anyone here is new. Um, I'll let the panel introduce themselves once we roll. Um, but real quick up front, maybe, maybe Jeff, Peter, I don't know if anyone wants to do a quick intro uh, for those that are on the panel, uh, want to give time for that, uh, feel free to to just hop in and say hi and uh, let folks know what you're up to. Uh, Peter McAlini here real quickly. Um, I actually attended the kickoff, I think it was last March um, in Denver when I was out visiting some of the folks at uh, University of uh, Denver and uh, do work in um, basically look at the continuum of uh, education to career education to employment, uh, recognizing that you know there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of players and traditional education is not necessarily the path that is gonna serve all constituencies. So um, I kind of work out in the margins. Yeah, and, and I do I do recall that was, that felt, feels like so long ago at this point, but uh, yeah, glad, glad to see you, Peter. Yeah, and I'm uh, Jeff Katzman. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Core Learning Exchange. We're a Colorado-based company. Um, we've developed a a platform that we uh, basically, we think of it like an operating system for CTE programs, where we have a platform that supports a mastery-based instructional model. Um, and then it's paired with a library of best of breed um, courses that are aligned to industry recognized credentials. And our goal is to be able to uh, enable CTE programs in local geographies, be able to uh, be responsive to workforce trends and be able to identify employers and be able to identify opportunities to train those students in high schools and get them into internships and um, apprenticeship programs and ultimately ideally lead to employment and providing you know, viable and, and sustainable pathways to good jobs in each local community that don't require a four-year degree but do require some post-secondary kind of um, <clears throat> um, you know, lifelong learning and kind of micro-learning and, and alternate credentialing. So if anyone's interested in uh, learning more about it, um, I can put a couple of links in the chat here and um, maybe we can pick up the conversation another time. Yeah, thanks, thanks for jumping in, Jeff. And yeah, please share. Uh, in fact, we should find some time to catch up. I think there's some, some yeah, good points potentially. Um, I think, but yeah, please share. I remember I think the last time we met, uh, it was like just before everything shut down. It was last, yeah. last February or March or something. Well, yeah. thanks, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, uh, uh, anyone else that wants to jump in and do a, a quick high level intro um that's a that's a true professional i see you have it queued up <laughs> um hi everybody Gita Verma. i'm actually a professor of stem education at cu denver but i'm doing this other work which is libdex dot 
arm. So what we're doing is uh, LibDex allows students to document their lived experiences happening in different aspects of their life, whether they've talked about CT or any of those things, and then translating those lived experiences into college and career readiness credentials, and then stacking them in the uh, platform and earning college credit from CU Denver. So, uh, so basically students in high school and college uh, can uh, come and you know, document their lived experiences. And so they're not doing any extra workshop or courses, but what they're doing is they're doing the reflection and metacognition in these experiences and then getting credentials for those. And we're doing this work specifically to uh, recognize that minoritized students have a lot of experiences, but they don't show up uh, in their GPAs and stuff like that. So love to connect with a bunch of you on this call. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gita. Obviously super exciting work and, and uh, have watched it evolve through time and it's really awesome to, to see it continue um, based on some of our early conversations when it was just the seed of an idea and now it's, uh, it's got so much more breadth to it. Um, Cool, anyone else uh, want to do a quick intro uh, up front here? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Wendy Charles. I'm Chief Scientific Officer at First IQ in Denver, Colorado. And um, we provide blockchain services for healthcare and life sciences organizations. And I'm pleased to say we have developed a platform to manage credentials, education, formal and informal credentials, and we're still developing. And so it's been a joy for me to learn from all of you about best practices, because this is such a needed technology in this space. Yes, can't sing the praises of Burst enough. One of the oh, thank sort of you. pioneers in Colorado as far as yeah. showing true value and use cases around blockchain. So Great. awesome Thanks. always to have you, Wendy. Um, cool. Uh, We'll keep moving quick here and um, I wanna share a few things and then turn it over. Uh, we've got Michael on from CDHE. Uh, to always, always like to put folks uh, from the state agency partners on the spot if they have anything to share. Um, um, the one, the one uh, opportunity I wanted to uh, bring attention to, uh, which Michael, I know Spencer is aware, but uh, we'll have to find some time is this uh, Sync Up Colorado challenge. Um, uh, and we're sort of in the process of exploring a proposal uh, to, to take part in that challenge. Um, so be in touch if it's of interest or if you've got a thought and direction, obviously there's a lot of great existing communities and products amongst this group. Um, so that's just a recent opportunity uh, with some, some pretty big funding behind it. Uh, so again, Colorado focused, but um, be in touch if, if there's interest. Uh, we're, we're currently exploring a uh, sort of three-part uh, project and proposal um, uh, that, that is sort of directly in line with a lot of the work that we've been talking about through this group for, for many years. So hopefully a, a good opportunity. Um, yeah, Michael, over to you. Anything, uh, floor is yours for, for whatever you need, five to 10 minutes. Sure, absolutely. And I don't even know if I'll take that long, but um, always great to be with you all and, and uh, being able to provide our perspective from the Department of Higher Ed. I'm Michael Vonte, the Senior Director of Research and Data Governance at the Colorado Department of Higher Education. Um, a couple of things that I'll bring up to this group, just as kind of an update, I brought it up in, in other conversations too, um, is around CDHE's work in, in terms of cr enhancing credential transparency. Uh, you've heard me talk a, a little bit about some of the work that we have been doing with our eligible training provider list or ETPL and being able to expand the information that we collect via the ETPL so that we can be in alignment with national best practices uh, around how we talk around all, about all of these education and training opportunities. So being able to be in alignment with some of the work that Credential Engine is doing and the CTDL that I know that they've deployed. Um, thinking about some of the work that the National Skills Coalition has done around quality non-degree credentials, uh, being able to be in alignment with that. Also being able to think about the alignment with, the, with some of the EQUOS work. I don't know if some of you might be familiar with their efforts, but really just trying to get us all on the same page with how we talk about education and training opportunities, being able to have a similar taxonomy and being able, at least from the state's perspective, to get to a place where we have that canonical source of information of, of all the different types of education and training opportunities that are available in Colorado. And maybe the ETPL is the way that we can do that. So uh, a lot of my colleagues have been very involved in a lot of those conversations and we continue to, to kind of um, put the, um, oh, what is it? 
pedal to the metal. That's not what I'm looking for. Anyway, I'm looking for some metal metaphor. But anyway, being able to really kind of execute on that work. Um, and uh, that's going to come into to shape probably over the course of the next six months or so. I think by end of summer, we're hoping to kind of have our ducks in a row and being able to kind of push that out to the wider community in terms of collecting that more robust data and what that means and looks like. Um, another initiative that I'll mention to this group, and, and, and I don't know if I've talked about it before, um, but we've started to kind of firm up ideas around a relationship between the state of Colorado and Ripple, or Research Improving People's Lives, for some of you who might be familiar with their work in Rhode Island and, and I think Virginia and a few other states as well. Um, so being able to leverage their expertise and the ecosystem that we have in Colorado, especially around the data trust that we've developed in Colorado, to be able to enhance conversations around the ROI for various education and training opportunities. Uh, Ripple has done some great work and their data scientists have done some great work around these topics. And so being able to really leverage the work that Ripple does um, in Colorado and being able to, to leverage the work that we've, we've done in Colorado around the, the establishment of the data trust. So thinking about how all of these pieces play together between the state, between Ripple, between Bright Hive, um, I, I, we've come a long way. And I, I think we're again gonna see over the next, let's say six months or so, some, uh, some things that we are hoping to get out there into the world and being able to, to use state data in well-governed responsible ways to answer a variety of questions and a variety of use cases. Um, so so as you know, we get some findings from that work or there are some more things to report, I will absolutely share them with this group, but just really excited about kind of connecting as many of those dots as we can. Um, that's all I can think of at the moment. Very happy to kind of talk or, or um, take questions. Yeah, if, any, if anyone wants to jump in and uh, ask a question or two, we can certainly do that. And I saw, uh, I see Russell joined as well. Want to give him uh, some time here to, to update some folks on his work, but yeah, any, any questions for Michael before we get there? Michael, I just wanted to say it's always a joy to hear about your progress, and I am such a cheerleader and champion for the work that you're doing in higher education. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and, and so appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, you know, a, a lot of this work, as Taylor very well knows, is us just all getting on the same page and kind of rowing in the same direction. And so, uh, so happy to have all of your brains as part of this work as well, but thank you. Cool. Well, the, the, uh, the other piece of this triad that uh, we always love to get updates from Michael representing CDHE. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm with Learning Economy and sort of representing C-Lab broadly, um, but, but Russell uh, is with OIT. Uh, anything, my Colorado or any direction, uh, Russell, feel free to, to jump in and share the latest greatest. There's, there's always plenty going on in your world. Oh, yeah. There, there's, a, there's a whole lot, you know. Um, we, um, we came out from February with uh, ETH Denver. We got a lot of really great projects, even some that um, have a lot more to do with education with the DID adapters and things that were created for, from some really great, um, great submissions and great teams that are out there. Um, we also, um, um, we've made a lot of progress. So now we have, um, we have a, a more, the, the digital identity implementation in Colorado is larger than the rest of the United States combined. Um, so we have a longer, bigger footprint. Um, we have already eight uh, police departments, including state patrol, and we have uh, an announcement with 12 more coming on next week. So um, pretty amazing adoption. And, and, you know, I think key to that is not to get too buried in like having to have a true, you know, Full implementation according to any one spec. We really had to make it work in Colorado for Coloradans. And so we couldn't really depend on a system that required, you know, hardware to be purchased and software to be changed and things like that if we wanted to have quick adoption. So um, that's been great. We deployed the, um, we now have, you can now get your fishing license as part of My Colorado. And we're working with the, uh, um, lot with the, uh, um, liquor and cannabis um, enforcement, as well as gaming, to make it so that you can electronically prove you are who say you are to do online sports betting or to order from a dispensary and pay for it, or to prove that you are who you say you are in like a liquor delivery. So we're looking at these as all really, really huge things. Um, our 
uh, our number of accounts was up around 135,000 before we just uh, deleted all the accounts that either had only been logged in once or had not been logged in for more than a year. So we're down to 80,000 now, but those are 80,000 users who are using it all the time, uh, which is I don't know, really, really exciting for us. Um, our standards that we're focusing on are really more the MDL standards because that's the DMV's um, issue in those ISOs, which are surprisingly different than the DID uh, specifications that are out there. But um, we're hoping to like basically implement both. Uh, it just, we have to find the right customer within the state who wants them. But, um, but really, we think that that's where the, the highest value is and we're continuing to add more um, so that people can get, if nothing else, you know, if, if you do nothing else but are a fan of digital identity and sovereign identity, the fact that more and more people are getting used to using it and all the, you know, all the government agencies take it, and businesses now take it all, um, we're making enormous headway just from that aspect. Um, and then the fact that we're actually using it to do things is even is even cooler. Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on. Like, if the, the, talk about like collaboration and community impact. You know, every sort of new use case and new deployment just expands. You know, the at least the purview of what's possible. You know, in in, in the world of you know self sovereignty and and new forms of digital identity. So yeah, can't say enough about what that's doing. For the broader landscape, both in Colorado and obviously have gotten a ton of recognition, you know, nationally as well. Um, yeah, so thanks, Russell, as always. I know you got plenty, and you, you always jump in to give an update. I appreciate it. Um, any questions uh, for for Russell? And obviously, everyone, feel free, hang on, and, and join the conversation uh, with the panelists we have. Um, but also, no problem if you got to hop. Uh, any any questions for Russell or Michael? Um, this is Wendy. I have a quick question for Russell. I have shown the My Colorado app that I love um, to some of our partners and colleagues um, in other states and to show what is possible. And they are very interested in learning more about how better to convert for their states. Is there a resource I can point them to so that they can learn more from Colorado's success? Uh, sure, you, we, um, you can have them in touch with me, give them my contact info and I'll... Okay. Um, I'll get them either somebody who can answer their questions or, you know, it depends on whether they're coming from a technical standpoint or logistics. Like mm -hmm. for instance, we've um, met with uh, the folks in Florida who are coming out in a couple of, uh, in a month or two with digital ID, um, talk to them about sort of lessons learned and they realized that they hadn't like reached out at all with enforcement. Right. So the police wow. were left out. It was all mainly just, uh, getting readers to the uh, merchants who are doing certain mm -hmm. things. And then, um, you know, we talked to, I think, South Dakota, we've talked to a few others, but mm -hmm. always eager to get to share. I mean, what we would love is for the ability to, um, to actually make this into software that any state could leverage, Yeah. you know, to, to do what they need to do. Um, it's uh it's hard to do to do business like that. I mean, it's hard enough to do business with it with one state, um, you know, using something that's like quasi open source or something like that. But it's even trickier when you're doing it, trying to do it with multiple states across the states and stuff like that. So we're trying to figure out what the best way is to do it. Um, we got patents just in case, you know. Oh, but. good plan. Will, will the code be open source or not? Uh, I think it depends, you know. Okay. Um, if we, you know, if we had like a consortium of states that decided they wanted to go this way, um, I think that probably would be a, uh, a good approach. Um, but if not, I doubt we would, you know, we'd open up the code just to, because that, that much transparency might be a little bit much. Awesome, thank you for your availability. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, for, for better or worse, I dropped your email there, Russell. I know you're, you're open to folks hitting you, so I figured it was all right, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, cool, yeah. Um, awesome, uh, so yeah, and in fact, speaking of uh, uh, ETH Denver, and I, uh, Russell brought it to mind, but um, one of the groups that emerged out of that, uh, CERTO, which formerly is, is Uport, um, part of the sort of consensus uh, mesh family. Uh, for those following the Web3 blockchain world, they're sort of under that umbrella, um, but we're doing, uh, we're, we're 
pretty close to formalizing and, and have sort of wheels on a pilot uh, to work with them at UCCS, as well as potentially across a couple of institutions um, to, to pilot uh, some of their sort of back end. Again, he, he used DID, decentralized identifiers. That actually, that specification just sort of grew in maturity uh, to the next level. Um, I'll share a few things in the chat, uh, but be in touch if there's interest. We, uh, we're pretty excited about uh, what some of their tech along with aligning with how the state's evolving and the digital ID and some of what uh, we've got sort of brewing on the learning economy side um, to make sure it's obviously all aligned to uh, to education. So um, a lot uh, a lot happening uh, uh, all at once. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, just, just be in touch. Um, one thing to uh, a model that I think is really interesting and worth looking at um, there's a group, uh, and I'll, I'll share as I go here. I don't have a backup today to, to manage the chat. Um, um, but this is a, uh, whoop, and uh, let's see, everyone. Um, the Silicon Valley Innovation Program, which is out of the Department of Homeland Security, has been working on these sort of interop plug fest for quite a while. Um, that's a really heavy deck, so maybe just queue it up and take a look later. Uh, but we're exploring through a few different channels, uh, something similar, whether it's at the state level or nationally, to start to demonstrate interoperability between uh, products and systems. Um, and they've got a good model around digital wallets uh, that have demonstrated uh, across a number of companies, sort of their portfolio companies, uh, very, very robust interoperability. Uh, and, and again, it's not specific to education, but, um, but the, the mapping based on some of the technology would be pretty straightforward, um, util utilizing verifiable credentials and things like that. So um, yeah, worth, worth a look. And again, uh, these are all sort of things in motion as we speak. Um, uh, there's also a, a new uh, wallet security group we've been uh, investing a bit in through the uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation. Um, that's a link to that working group ongoing, but for folks interested in security, there's a lot of pieces and parts moving uh, to ensure that that's largely um, a German-based project that sort of uh, seeded that, that group. Um, and then the last thing, we're uh, right up against the half hour. I wanted to make sure we left at least that for, for the panel. Um, oh, and sorry, uh, Certo, uh, for those curious and interested, uh, these are folks that, that uh, Russell and I and others have known for quite a while um, and have been doing really good work um, that's, that's a link to what they're up to. Uh, and again, we're, uh, looking to, to, you know, launch a number of pilots. Um, certainly, uh, Russell, we're, you know, still very much interested in all of this living under the same umbrella to demonstrate whether it's VMI Colorado, whether it's, you know, utilizing, um, I guess more, uh, you know, sort of web three focused tech, um, you know, demonstrating that in the end, it does, you know, all of this offers new interesting value to two students and uh, two employers on the other side. So full cycle on the sort of supply demand of education and employment. Um, so yeah, that, that I think uh, let's, this was the one last thing I wanted to mention um, before we turn it over. Uh, we're also, uh, we just kicked off um, work with the Open Skills Network. Uh, some are, of, are aware of that, um, but we're right now uh, managing their first cohort of 14 pilots, um, and those pilots are listed there. Um, and uh, this is sort of an aligned but separate project. Um, there's no direct Colorado pilot connection there, but I really uh, would be interested in those that want to go down that road. They'll have another summer cohort that rolls through, and so um, sort of in the process of identifying a few folks in Colorado that would uh, sort of be a uh, a good candidate for for that next round of pilots. Um, but that that work is all about it's largely driven by Western governors, but also um, funded by Walmart. And, and there's a lot of a lot of corporate interest in uh, open skills taxonomies, uh, sort of machine readable skills, uh, and ensuring that um, there's common language and common practices around the use of um, uh, skills and and specific taxonomies to make those interoperable and, and usable across you know various systems. So, Open Skills Network, uh, take a look. We're uh, learning economy is is now part of a sort of three part triad uh, supporting and managing that. So we have a pretty good pretty good purview into how that works evolving. 
uh, that's it for me. I'm going to uh, shut up. I'll kind of queue up the order and would love uh, the folks we have here uh, to just give a sense of the work you're doing. Um, and again, a lot of that uh, early conversation may or may not directly apply to sort of this idea of, of collaboration and community impact, but I think it does. Um, but we'd love to hear a bit about your organization. Um, and, and maybe we'll go through one round of just intros and then and then sort of launch into the, the conversation, which I think I really just want to tee up the idea of, you know, what does uh, collaboration and community impact look like in April 2021, you know, potentially looking at sort of a, you know, post COVID or, or post, uh, you know, year of COVID. I don't know if there's such thing as post COVID. I, I fear using that because I, I think it's here to stay in some ways, um, but we're certainly moving towards a better spot. So anyway, yeah, uh, you know, what it, what it represents, uh, what your organization represents, your work represents within how this, you know, how this new world is, is coming to be when it comes to education. So, um, if it's cool, I'm going to go, uh, sort of just based on what I'm seeing here, but, but Walter, uh, then Sam, then, uh, then Celine, uh, then, uh, Lauren, um, and, uh, then Camila, if that works, uh, Quick intro, organizational sort of maybe maybe a minute on on what you're up to, and then we'll the second piece will dive into the actual conversation. Walter, over to you. Cool, thanks, Taylor. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces here and uh, everyone else as well. Um, so I'm Walter Walzer. I'm actually in St. Petersburg, Florida, but my connection to Colorado is that uh, I'm in uh, I'm a professor at I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Denver. Prior, I was a clinical professor of educational leadership at the University of Denver as well. And uh, the two organizations, I'll just put them here in, um, in the chat, but um, uh, Taylor and I connected around the Web3 world and ETH Denver and the blockchain space. And since then, we've kind of been trying to, uh, we've been collaborating on trying to bring more capacity to the K-12 space and understanding broadly a lot of these tectonic shifts that are happening in technology. So more around things like open source thinking or what we would call or kind of like adaptive shifts that need to happen in the education space before we get to the technical stuff. Uh, and that's kind of a world that I work in all the time with scholarship or with collaborations. How can we bring the K-12 space to move into this next dimension? And that may be a little bit different than higher ed or other environments um, and even within the K-12 space, there are nuances, like Jeffrey mentioned, the CTE space is very progressive, moving toward micro-credentials and pathways. There's lots of nuances. So tackling this from sort of a broad lens of how do we build capacity in the K-12 space for that, that's what Rad Schools does. Uh, quick note on Learn Open, the Open Partnership Education Network was a program I started at the University of South Florida that was designed sort of like an open source TED or an open source Aspen Institute. Essentially, how can we make cities smarter and better connected? I was charged with creating a program from scratch that would kind of do that. And the two key pieces that I kind of infused from the beginning was kind of an open source ethos. If we're gonna do that, and we're gonna create an Aspen Institute in our community, how can we do this in a more open source way? It shouldn't be me deciding who the speakers are and what the conversations are. It should be the community thought leaders in these spaces. So we created a framework and a platform for that. And uh, you can just take a look and see what we've created. Uh, but real fast forward on that, uh, that started in 2017. Uh, Post-COVID, two key forces came into play that changed the direction of open and allowed me to spin it off as a, as a uh, nonprofit uh, outside of the university. The University of South Florida consolidated, and that's a long story, but essentially uh, that in COVID, there are a lot of other priorities than the open program. And so I was given an opportunity to kind of take that and spin it off. And that's where it's at right now. It's really just in the uh, early stages of becoming an independent enterprise. And the idea is how can we infuse the, the most relevant technologies and ideas into a platform for community learning? So it, it runs the gamut of pretty much everything that's on this panel. Uh, and then lastly, uh, um, Taylor just noted the article that we wrote together for Diplomatic Courier. We talk about this open source idea and how we can bring this to the education space. We've kind of evolved this into a book chapter that's coming out soon. Hope to share that with the C-Pulse community. 
And uh, in a nutshell, that's really just kind of um, pushing us to think about our orientations as leaders. We really need to kind of um, recalibrate in a lot of spaces how we approach ideas to, to evolve much more rapidly and to innovate much more rapidly. So uh, that's, that's a lot. I look forward to hearing from the rest of the panel there. No, that's, that's perfect. You were just about two minutes. So I think if we can stick, stick with that, we'll be in good shape. So yeah, over to you, Sam. Yeah, I feel a little out of place. I know nothing about blockchain or open source or decentralized technology, uh, but this has been really interesting. And um, now that I think about it more, as I hear you all talk, I think there's some, some really interesting overlaps with some of the work that we're doing at the Colorado Youth Congress. Um, so my name is Sam. I'm the founder and executive director of CYC. And we work with high school students across the state to lead systems change, specifically in the areas of racial justice and mental health. And the way we do that is, you know, we recruit a group of about 60 high school leaders across Colorado, and then they go out and build relationships with decision makers in the education system. So superintendents and school board members and state legislators and all with the hope of creating a platform where policy innovation can take place, where youth voice is actually centered. Um, you know, at least for those of you who have, who know the education system, it is not known for being responsive to young people's needs. There's just no infrastructure built to actually understand what young people need or are experiencing or want, um, let alone decision-making processes that include youth. <clears throat> so we, um, just a few months ago, we launched our Systems Change Network and uh, we have about 40 partners so far. So our students, um, you know, in essence, co-create solutions to these massively complex problems of youth mental health um, and then racial injustice in schools. And, you know, ultimately, I think what we're trying to do here is shift the power dynamics within the education system to be so the education system is more responsive to youth by giving youth a voice in decision making and, um, and ultimately, it's more agile that we can operate faster based on what's happening in the ecosystem. And there's a space where if you're the superintendent or you're an advocacy group or a funder or anyone in the education ecosystem, and you want to understand what young people are experiencing and need, you have a space to go, you know, and that's the Colorado Youth Congress. That's where we hope, hope to be. Um, so I'm really excited, you know, talk hearing you all talk about some of this technology and these big efforts. I'm very interested in hearing in what ways are there efforts to shift power dynamics? I mean, it's happening already, but um, but how much is that is intentional versus just a byproduct of decentralization? So thanks for letting me be here. I'm excited to participate. Yeah, Sam, thank you. And I can't say enough about the work and I love the, uh, the I go too far down the, the rabbit hole when it comes to blockchain and Web3 as folks know. Um, but these are all human problems. Like, the, you know, none of this matters. It's an analog and digital world. So. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that's the beauty of community, uh, and you know, it's, it's gotta be both. So yeah. And, and just, yeah, our, our history and you providing a sounding board and always being, uh, just a great colleague to connect with, like, can't, can't thank you enough. So thanks for being here. Uh, I can't remember. I think, I think Celine may be next. Yeah, it's me. Awesome. Um, hi everyone. Uh, Sam, I'd love to pick your brain one day, um, soon, maybe about how just, in general, adults are receiving your work. And as a former educator, I can imagine kids are loving it. Um, but I'm so curious on, on the flip side, how, um, I don't know, the grownups are interacting with them. Um, so like I said, my name is Celine. I'm the chief program officer for Spark Mindset. And Spark Mindset right now is, we are in a startup phase, but we are focusing on cybersecurity training for both high school students and adults. So right now we're operating in both Louisiana and trying to get our foothold in Colorado. Um, we offer essentially, a, a, for high school students, it's a two-year pathway. And so kiddos get two credentials along the way. I don't know if you are all familiar with CompTIA credentials, but the first one, kiddos get Network Plus, and then the second year they get uh, Security Plus. And then all of our students, both high school and adult learners, have the opportunity to go into apprenticeship. So we're really super stoked. We actually just were approved by the U.S. Department of Labor to be the first ever cybersecurity apprenticeship for high school students. Um, 
and also the first cybersecurity apprenticeship that offers remote opportunities. Um, and so I'd love to bring that back when we discuss collaboration and community, um, but it's been really interesting navigating something as innovative as a remote um, cybersecurity apprenticeship in a structure that's a little bit more um, fixed and traditional like the US Department of Labor. Um, so it's been a really fun process, but ultimately we've been successful. Um, and then the last thing, I guess the last plug or last, um, I think really important piece of information to share is that we're as an organization are really focused on under-resourced communities. So we know that the cybersecurity industry and IT in general is predominantly uh, male, white male dominated. And so we're really interested in finding ways and solutions to bring cybersecurity training um, to women and especially um, young black women. And so one of our biggest successes this year in 2021, we launched our first cohort of adult learners and we have 60% black women from across the country. Um, so it's, you know, it's felt amazing to be able to um, scale and simultaneously stick to our mission and vision. Um, so that's a little bit about Spark Mindset. I'll pass it over to Lauren. Thanks, Celine. Um, hey, I'm Lauren Trent. I'm the CEO of a new nonprofit in Denver called Advanced EDU. We're Colorado's first and only hybrid college. Um, and we are a thing because I used to be um, a, an educator within the Denver public school system um, and in a leadership role, actually oversee, oversaw CTE and, and youth apprenticeship there. So um, I've come across um, several of you before. But what, what I observed is that here in Denver, 83 out of 100 high school freshmen wouldn't go on to ultimately earn a degree or credential that would qualify them for a family sustaining job. And what I also saw is that a lot of students wanted that, um, but the lived experience was such that the, the majority of students in the DPS system were first generation college students. Um, they knew they wanted to work while they were pursuing higher education. Maybe they had family commitments, um, caring for, for siblings or commitments with a family business. And so the idea of sort of putting your life on hold for you know two to four years to mold to a traditional college format and schedule didn't feel necessarily um, super attainable. And so that got um, myself and, and actually a lot of business and education leaders here in Denver thinking like, how could you sort of reimagine college um, to do some of the things that, that um, Sam, you were talking about before? How do you be more responsive to the needs of students um, in real time? Um, and be able to sort of deploy resources to help them in their journey. So that gets us to this, this concept of a, a hybrid college. Um, we combine four things. One is uh, digital degrees and credentials from trusted and accredited providers. The second is an in-person location, a co-learning campus that I'm sitting in right now in downtown Denver that provides quiet study space, um, meals, childcare, staff support, and a community of co-learners. Uh, the third thing is personal coaching, so success coaching that is um, a pretty intensive support provided to students um, as they're meeting with their success coaches at least twice a week via in-person and, and text, and that relationship is, is deep um, and, and um, one that's very meaningful to both student and, and staff member. And then the final piece is uh, paid work experience. So 100% of our students are working at least part-time. Um, and so what we do is support them from movement into the, maybe they're in their target industry, but many of our students come to us not in their target industry or in their target career. And we take the time that they're with us pursuing a degree and a credential to be able to move them into that. Um, target career. And so the, the culmination of it is an experience that's um, flexible, uh, deeply supported, and debt-free for 94% of our students. Um, we serve a really diverse population of students here. There are about 90% students of color, 88% first generation, like I said, 100% working, 25% parenting. Um, and we just have an amazing, um, you know, thriving culture where uh, it's, you know, whether online or in person, as it were in COVID, uh, you know, a lot of, of, of really great community happening. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. And I would say the same to haven't known Celine quite as, well, as, as long, but would say the same, obviously, to both of you. It's been awesome to just have the thought partnership and be able to uh, jam on really big ideas. Uh, you guys are doing amazing work. Um, so thanks to both of you. Uh, Last, certainly not least, uh, 
Camilla, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Camilla Modisset, and I'm the um, one of the founders, and I'm a director at the Denver Language School, which is a K-8 Denver public school. Um, and I'm with you, Sam, like a lot of this conversation, I'm like, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but what I will say, um, what I hear, what I think there's a lot in common here is this concept of like, how do we transform what we consider to be education? Like what has traditionally been defined as education and how do we transform what that is? And also how do we transform how it's delivered? Um, we exist, Denver Language School, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. We opened in 2010, we're a K-8 program. So we're, you know, we're not in the higher education space, but I have a lot of thought about it. I have, you know, I believe so strongly that so much of this transformation has to happen in these, at the, in this K-8, K-12 um, arena, because that's just like where you get your foothold. But um, we are an early total immersion, uh, an early total language immersion school, which means all of our students are doing either Chinese or Spanish. And their, um, their, the academic content is delivered through the language. We are one of the only schools in the entire country that has the model that we have, which is um, early total immersion. So the kids are doing like K2, they're doing their full day in Chinese or Spanish, then we start to add English and then by middle school, they're 50-50. I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time about the model, but I don't wanna spend, spend a lot of time talking about that right here. Um, but we really believe, like I said, we're one of the only schools in the country doing this. We have very high results. Um, we're a very high performing school. We're award-winning school. We're part of the Denver Public School portfolio. And we just believe really strongly in creating this conversation around like, how do we transform what we consider education and how it's delivered? And how can we have good results doing this? Um, we serve eight, we serve almost 900 students in Denver Public Schools. We have a very diverse school population. Um, we, this model serves everybody. Like there's no better language learner than a young child. <laughs> and so this model is really good for lots of different students. And we send them on to high school. So there's lots of people here on this call that I would love to talk more to about um, also like what high school looks like for our kids who are leaving Den Denver language school. And I'm just really excited to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Camilla. And uh, we'll say I got a, I got a firsthand tour of uh, how amazing the work that's going on there. It truly is. Um, and seeing the, uh, you know, the, the just value of like, you know, these kids learning language and crossing, you've got Chinese in one room, you've got Spanish in another and all being under the same roof. I mean, there's, to me, to me, there's no learning quite like it. So um, amazing, amazing opportunity. Uh, and thanks for that, that tour. Uh, back back oh, with you. doing tours were, were a real thing with, with uh, <laughs> this was before COVID. Um, Cool, well, thanks everybody for those intros. Uh, this is perfect. We've got about 15 minutes. Uh, want to, this is sort of the now op open up and blow the top off things uh, sort of segment for the last 15 minutes. Uh, you know, to me in many ways, what we're doing right here certainly is collaboration. There is potential in these sorts of spaces to have very direct impact on communities, um, but would love uh, just First, the panel, and then obviously we can we can open it up to uh, the broader the broader crew. But uh, you know, where are we with being able to collaborate and um, make make impact on communities locally, given the state of the world? Um, I don't need to go into the details. We've all heard it enough. But things are different. Things are changing. I um, one of the thing the, the small pieces I hope to bring to to groups like th this is that I stay at a really high thirty thousand foot view. I can't help it. It's in my DNA. Um, and I think we just constantly underestimate what's happening right now. Um, it's like crazy, crazy fast in some ways in long term, but all, at the same time, like it doesn't seem like anything's changed. Um, and that's just the, the nature of linear thinking and you know, humans not being uh, you know, set up to think exponentially. Um, but, but clearly we know now with, with COVID and sort of the mass digitization that all of you have experienced, certainly it's impacted education as much as anything. How do we think about collaborating and, and making impact, uh, you know, locally, uh, given the current state of the world? <laughs> and, and can take, take that or, or go other directions if that brought up other thoughts. Yeah, so I'll, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so something that's been 
on my mind quite a bit recently is just um, kind of the tension between wanting to scale and wanting to have larger impact and finding kind of a market fit um, that allows us to expand and, and, and have a greater reach while simultaneously understanding that in order to be an impactful organization, we need to be flexible and be nimble enough to adapt to what different communities needs are. And so I think there can be some real tension, um, at least in the startup space, when you're really trying to figure out what are we offering, um, that's a real tension that we are navigating. And so I'll give you kind of a more specific example of, of needing to meet communities needs. So for example, we have this apprenticeship program that we're offering. And in Colorado, the idea of a virtual or re remote apprenticeship it's like, hurrah, everybody loved that idea because especially in rural Colorado, it's the idea that young people or really anybody can have a very high wage, high growth job and stay in their community. And we got so much feedback from rural Colorado that that's something that they really are desiring. People wanna stay in their communities and they wanna make money. Um, and right now there's that, uh, that sweet spot, that opportunity doesn't entirely exist. So the idea of a remote apprenticeship is like very attractive. But on the flip side, we went to New Orleans and the idea of a remote apprenticeship was like appalling to people. They're all like, no, 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 no. That's, we want our students, students from New Orleans, our kids to be working in New Orleans based companies with New Orleans based mentors and have the opportunity to show up in person in our community and serve our community. And so we learned very quickly that that model that we just created and, and designed for Colorado schools um, and Colorado communities like does not translate. Um, and so, you know, that for us, the implication is we need to find industry partners that can offer both, um, both an in-person apprenticeship and a remote apprenticeship. Um, but to me, that highlights that finding community impact is, is listening closely to the community's needs and, and what communities are saying that they want um, and being nimble enough as an organization to be able to meet those, to, to meet the needs. Yeah, I, I know that Sam, you likely that that probably hits home in a lot of ways, scaling and growing and changing, but yeah, any, any other thoughts? I, yeah, I mean, and I know we're, we all live in those, those worlds of you know, starting small, but building the capacity on, this, on the micro, knowing that we want to change the world in the macro. I think that's a, it's a really relatable tension. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this in terms of, you know, when CYC is very focused on systems change, and that's our ultimate goal. Um, and yet it's so easy to think about systems change, but then play the game as it's been set up. And what you really do in that case without actually changing your process of how you make decisions internally, you recreate the same dynamics that we see in society. And so even we're very, we're, especially in this space of, of tech, um, it's a technical sort of understanding. And so what happens often is decisions are made in a hierarchical centralized way because we have the knowledge, we have the understanding, and we do so with good intentions to serve our community, but we're not really looping them in in any meaningful way. Um, and so that might be my, so unless we're conscious about that, about how we make decisions internally to our organizations and within our community, bringing in our end user and having them co-create this stuff with us, my worry is that we just recreate the same systems that we have with maybe different products, but ultimately we have sort of the same um, the same top heavy sort of uh, few people, few organizations taking advantage of all the technological change while everyone else is ultimately left behind. Um, and so that might be my big push to the group and something we try to practice is how do we bring students into CYC to make strategic decisions, programmatic decisions, and unless that's our primary focus and unless we do that, it's sort of hypocritical to go to the education system and say, hey, you need to do things differently if we're not willing to do that ourselves. Yeah, I want to echo strongly echo Sam's point of view is we're trying to shift conversations, especially in today's context, uh, whether it comes to marginalized communities or any other stakeholder. And yet we are coming at this problem from a very status quo perspective and not really deconstructing and disrupting 
the way things are done, especially in the education settings, which again replicate and duplicate the biases that happen. Uh, and so bringing uh, the people that are most affected, whether they benefit or don't benefit to the table is so important. And uh, so I, I just wanna say that we, as we all engage in this work, um, I would really encourage us to think about the end user and how we can bring their voice to whatever product we are developing. Yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about what it means to be a very responsible, caring, thoughtful wrecking ball within big power structures. <laughs> and it's not easy, um, but that's sort of the challenge at hand, right? I, I, I really like, um, thinking that's possible to, to do both those things at once. Um, any, any other thoughts that from certainly the panel? And I know we're down to our last five to 10 here. Um, I see, you know, Steve, thank you for joining. Chris, uh, other colleagues, Brenda, certainly uh, folks that have, have a lot of experience and uh, uh, great ideas in, when it comes to to this sort of thinking. Um, anyone else that wants to jump, jump in on the panel maybe next and then, uh, maybe tee up uh, some of the other folks that are on if you want to say something. I, I can jump in. I'm not sure if I have a totally cohesive set of thoughts around this, mainly because we launched in the midst of COVID. And so um, we started our full-time team in early, I was hired in early March last year. We launched with students in June, rewrite, rewrote the plan on week two. Um, I'm not sure what it's like to collaborate in this environment outside of COVID. But I have, you know, been in similar roles before where it's like, you know, just like this before this sort of partnership within the education and workforce workforce ecosystem was really at the core of the model. And what I've noticed now is that like the ability to sort of um, get together, um, both with like partners, but also with students and families, like in person and sort of develop that trust and rapport is significantly d diminished. And I don't have like a really good answer um, for that. Certainly we, we've been making some progress with students and families and on the partnership front too. But I do think, you know, settings like this, um, being able to just see who else is out there in the world and have an opportunity to make connections in the same way that you would at a conference or a panel discussion um, live previously is, is, you know, really helpful. And I know I've already made a couple connections in the, in the chat box that I'm really excited to follow up on. I, um, I might have a little bit of a different take on this, but also um, not in this, in the time that we're in right now, but when I think back to starting the Denver Language School, um, you know, our model was so like, people were so freaked out by what we were proposing, right? They were like, they're not going to learn English till third grade. And DPS is literally under a court order that like <laughs> for their English language learners, like, are you out of your mind? Um, so, so one of the things I do want to put a little bit of an emphasis on is the research and the data, right? So we had to just keep saying and showing people like, there's research and data out here that like, if you do X, Y, Z, your results will be A, B, C, right? Like we just had to keep showing people the data and the research and, and saying like, this is data-driven, this is research-based, this is data-driven, this is research-based. And, um, you know, 10 years into it now, and even sooner, we've had results even sooner, but like, we're really proving out the model. And so I think it's so important to have stakeholder engagement that's really authentic and really stay open and curious in the conversations and listen to people's concerns, but don't ever walk away from the data or the research. Like that's really, because you, you know, um, people have really strong opinions, <laughs> but they're not based in data or research. And that can be, at least in education, you wanna be really careful where you're going with that. Yeah, maybe maybe it's time for uh, another thought or two as we as we come upon the hour. Um, yeah, would uh, Bitsy, I know I know you you've played in this uh, this world a bit when it comes to sort of data and, and research and, and making sure that uh, there is a there there and we're not just pontificating and uh, you know uh, theorizing. But I, I'm guilty of that in some cases. Um, but any anyone else? Yeah, maybe time for a couple more thoughts. <laughs> jump in and say that part of the problem or what do you want to watch out for with the research is that it, if it's being done in higher ed, it's a couple of years behind everything. 
and um, that part of it can be difficult to put together with real disruption, which is fast and furious. And um, I don't think it's bad or wrong. I just think it's the truth. Um, so paying attention to that is important. Some mixture of what are we doing right now and what is past experience shown us is important. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I've been around this for a long time. And honestly, I think that the, the I, I like Taylor's um, description of the disruption that it really um, being nice about it and kind of taking your time in my experience works sometimes, but not very often. And you really have to, you know, disruption is about just making a whole bunch of people unhappy for a little while until they can see a different way. And um, change agents in higher education have to be troublemakers my opinion yeah it's it's not surprising that this to me is is a full room of my favorite kind of troublemakers so i think that's that's exactly right any other yeah final thoughts we've got a couple minutes um certainly if folks need to jump totally get it and thanks for joining if you, if you do uh, i always in fact some of these run hour and a half two hours because we just get into a groove and and chat after the fact, so I'll certainly hang on if folks want to, but um, yeah, maybe a, a final, who wants to give the final word here? <laughs> maybe, Jeff, Jeff, you were ready until I, until I framed well, it. Well, I, I, I don't really want to give the final word, but I was, you know, I haven't articulated what I'm trying to say very clearly yet, but, you know, as a, as a startup company in Colorado trying to, you know, our mission is really to kind of be sort of, you know, piece together part of the ecosystem that allows schools and CT programs in multiple contexts in middle school, high school, community college, you know, training, retraining centers and, and youth opportunity youth kind of programs to be responsive to local workforce needs. We're, we're bumping in and we're, you know, there's so many overlapping agencies and government kind of things. There's, you know, we're, you know, the DOL, the DOE, the governor, all of these kind of private organizations that, um, and, and nonprofits that are doing internships and trying to you know, connect all the dots here. It's it's just a very um, difficult kind of landscape to navigate as an as an entrepreneur in a startup, and really trying to like, you know, where are the bones buried, and you know who is who's the right person to talk to, and how you know it, the the real solution would be that you have clear vertical integration that you can create a pipeline of students that starts in the middle school and continues through lifelong learning. But there are so many interruptions in that chain because it crosses so many different jurisdictions and different kind of uh, people. So we're, I'm just kind of bumping my head up against that problem. And I'm wondering if anyone else has experienced sort of, you know, there's uh, too many good duders and a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen here. And um, it's, you know, I mean, where's the trusted source of truth in this scenario? Uh, this is Steve from the Washington State uh, Community and Technical College, and, I, and I, I'm actually I'm kind of inspired by by what I what I hear. Yeah, that's probably and they're not necessarily one offs, but they are examples of what could be done. I, you know, I think one of the things that I thought about uh, a few months ago, I was reading a piece where we were always talking about, or the, the piece was really talking about, let's get our students and we're again the community college system let's get our students back into work jobs you know and they're always talking about jobs in, you know in the local manufacturer or whatever and 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 i'm actually inspired by some of the examples here where where well we actually kind of need uh, a shift in in our paradigm you know it was a depressing for me it was a depressing four years we just came out of and thinking what you know we're talking about um you know, employing people, but we're not actually talking about how do we get policies or how do we get people engaged in a democratic process. So, I mean, in a way, when people are talking about pedagogy and, you know, different kinds of apprenticeships and diversities and, and, and uh, policy development for high school students, you know, it's, it's actually pretty inspiring to me to think that, that that is actually another example of how how we could think outside the box in a way, and it's just an example of it. So. Anyway, that, enough of that said. <laughs> Taylor, if I can jump in real quick on that, what Steve just mentioned, and uh, I know our group is a little smaller, but I, um, you know, one of the 
we, we mentioned it in the chapter coming up that one of the concerns that we have to deal with, and it's going to be groups like this that I think have to solve it, is we're actually going to just exponentially increase the complexity and the amount of uh, dissonance and static with innovation if we do not address the source code at the at the policy and ground level addressing these innovations and vetting them and implementing them and it goes to every single example whether it's how we deal with data camilla's bringing up a great example of following the data data will now be so distributed and interpreted in so many ways through uh, multiple lenses that how will we make sense of that going back to sam who's not with us right now but uh if we don't figure out systems, the hows to the whys, that yet we do need voices that are much more responsive and, uh, and rapid deployment, rapid prototyping. If we don't figure out how to do these things on a source code level and get a real operating system, um, all of these great ideas are just going to um, create, but mathematically, it will just create more uh, complexity. And that's what we've seen in the K-12 level for sure, innovations. The timing, by the time those things deploy, we find out they didn't work and there was, you know, a whole generation that was lost. That's, I think, what, what a group like this has to kind of solve. And I think it's theoretical, it's source code foundational. And how are we going to prepare the leaders to kind of do that, you know? Yeah, ma'am. Walter and I have had uh, plenty of time to think about this. And I think that's exactly it. I mean, which is, I'm, I'm so glad you got there because to me, the, the, you know, collaboration and community impact, which in many ways is sort of on the front side, um, often feels disconnected from the plumbing you're speaking of and the, you know, deeper issues at that sort of source code level. Um, but it has to be both. It, like, we can't separate those things. Um, it's why, in fact, we, we have, we've had arguments over like whether or not we should continue to do these, these open standards sections and make sure folks are aware of some of those standards and, and policy implications ensuring that folks from, you know, CDHE give their perspective, like, you know, from that government lens. Um, I think, I think that's where, and, and it's what inspired me by learning economy in the first place. In a lot of ways, they started talking about, we need to replumb education city. That's one of the things I remember, um, Chris, the, the CEO talking about when we met in, in DC and kicked off this next chapter of my life was, was that exact, uh, that exact thing. And, and they were quite a way, ways ahead in their thinking of, how we can actually start to do that. Um, so yeah, Duh. oh man, Chris jumped off. I, I wanted him to jump on. He's, he's got a podcast and, and does some of this for a living. So I wanted to give him space, um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I think, I think that's exactly it. That's not an easy task, I, you know, but I've, I've, I've been really like inspired over the last couple of years, even with COVID. Um, there's a lot of momentum happening and it's at that level. It's re, the, 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 like it's no longer a question of whether or not there's bugs in the source code, right? That's the case. <laughs> I will argue to the death that whether or not there are some bugs. Um, and yeah, there's really interesting innovation. I don't uh, know if we want to stay on that tangent. We certainly can, or if others have have other thoughts. Um, and thanks for yeah, thanks for sticking around. And, and, and if not, I'm okay to either call it or uh, also, yeah, give a, give a parting word. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Brenda, I know you, you may or may not still be on. I know you, you jump into these um, pretty often. Would love to tee you up if you're around and want to say anything um, or at least, or, or just do an intro. Uh, a lot of folks I think know Brenda. And it might, it, it might've been a, plug in and then keep working situation. Well, Any Ty, other final thoughts? I just want to say thanks for bringing it together. And Celine, Camilla, Bitsy, Steve, I'll definitely reach out. Harris is a Rad School's partner. He's online. Um, I definitely want to reach out and connect. And uh, I think a lot of this is super inductive and magic happens in, in follow-ups and connections and serendipity. So it's really great to connect with everybody. Yeah, great. Thanks all. I'd love to leave it on that. I think uh, that's that's the hope with these. So thanks for that, Walter.
Yeah. Taylor, thanks for facilitating. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Taylor. It'll be a new flavor next month to come on back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, all. See you guys. Thanks. Bye.